Dear ladies and gentlemen, I'm pleased to be invited to talk about sound installations today. In fact, this is a very personal topic to me, my entry point. In 2005, my father, who was then working as a museum educator at the Hamburger Kunsthalle, the largest museum in Hamburg, asked me if I knew a certain Georg Haidu, who had contacted him in response to a request by the Kunsthalle to the Musikhochschule for designing a sound installation. The Kunsthalle planned a large exhibition with works by Caspar David Friedrich. In addition to numerous large format paintings, the exhibition was to include a series of so-called transparent paintings that Friedrich had delivered to Russia in the 1830s through the Tsar's family. While the originals are lost, sketches and his descriptive notes and instructions for the presentation of these paintings had been preserved. Originally, the three works were painted on semi-transparent paper. In the exhibition situation, a light source, presumably a candle or oil lamp, was to be placed behind the paintings to create an effect of devotion, depth and spaciousness. In addition, Friedrich wished that music should sound from the background, depending on which of the three pictures would be illuminated, secular, sacred or ethereal music of the spheres should be played. He mentioned for this the glass harmonica, a musical instrument invented by Benjamin Franklin in 1761. At that time, I was a guest student in a signal processing class at the HFMT. So yes, I replied to my father, I know Georg. I happened to be attending his class. Interesting coincidence, indeed. One thing led to another. A short time later, I was involved in this project as Georg's assistant and partner and made my first sound installation. I was a bit surprised and actually slightly shocked by Georg's attitude towards music in general. Of course, you can play fragments of very different pieces of medieval music at the same time. Different key and tempi, no problem. And let's find some samples of this glass harmonica. Then we'll build an algorithm that randomly generates a music that does not repeat within the three months of exhibition. Oh, and lights should also be switched on and off by our computer. Nothing easier than that. Wasn't there a MIDI controllable relay board by this company Dupfa? However, I must admit, this mindset was not entirely unknown to me. On the contrary, I've always been a tinkerer, perhaps played a little bit too much Legos as a child, preferably the Space and Technic editions. Back then, I always wanted to be an inventor, or a musician, or a teacher, like my parents. Electronic music was also by no means new to me. After school and training as a sound engineer in the late 90s, I had dealt extensively with the possibilities of electronic music production alongside my studies in systematic musicology. I played live electronics in various band constellations or produced my own electronic or hybrid music, but also radio plays and theater music. In retrospect, I realized how this initial project shaped my future. First, I decided to deal with the topic of sound installation art in my master's thesis at the university. Also, at the same time, Georg suggested that I might, might want to study in the recently founded multimedia composition program at the HFMT. And three years later, I graduated uh, with a greatly expanded pool of technical skills, largely freed from constraints and listening habits, and independent of industry developments to the ability to, to realize my own project-specific software with the help of Macs and custom-built hardware. So I had the feeling of having arrived, and actually I never really left the Hochschule since. Um, so after studying, so I kept my artistic practice, back then coming up with this Hexenkessel project, which is a uh, timpani basically with a projection inside and a, a tracking, mallet tracking or finger tracking system. And, um, and then after doing that, I returned to the university to complete my doctorate, as before, I did research in the field of sound, sound installation, but this time I was more concerned with the other side experience of the recipient. So that was in 2012 or 14. Then a three-year postdoc at HFMT followed, where I had the chance to rework the Hexenkessel. And uh, now I'm running the school's innovations lab with a job description that moved further and further away from classical musicology and composition and more and more in a different direction, making my old dream and come true, being an inventor and a musician and teacher and all this. So um, 
Yes, uh, so far for introduction. So I'm happy to talk about this now. Um, sound installation, sound art, uh, in German, we're talking about Klanginstallation, um, some different names. Um, so the definition of it, it's uh, sound installation is uh, rather difficult. This may be due to the fact that there are hardly any clear rules for this art form, as it is the case for most types of music. Also, the physical characteristics are missing that make up painting or sculpture. And even if it is possible to name a few typical characteristics, and I will try to do so, um, there is immediately a prominent counterexample. So, however, sound installations are often found in publicly accessible places or at festivals for new music or in galleries and museums. The conventional concert hall, on the other hand, seems unsuitable for the presentation. The sounds and noises, which are mostly electronically reproduced or synthetically generated, affect the recipient in combination with visual, architectural, and spatial elements that can be explored. In the process, the visitor to the sound installation is given a new role. From a musical um, perspective, he, is, he or she is invited to move freely in the sounding space and is invited to explore it with a personal temporality. The sound installation, unlike music, does not specify a narrative time structure. There is neither a beginning nor an end to the performance, but rather an almost static sonic experience that unfolds in space rather than in time. So with their work, sound artists describe a field of possibilities in which the recipients can actively, sometimes interactively act and create their own experience. This gives the audience the role of performers. They are less passive recipients than actors. The focus of the sound installation is, in contrast to works of multimedia art, for example, the auditory experience, listening. Um, right, so now to get a little bit um, deeper into it, uh, we are, figure it might be really good to go into history, um, since as uh, Frank Böhme uh, back then, so a teacher at HFMT told me it's really good to know your ancestors when you do things like this. And uh, nowadays, I really understand what he meant. So um, actually, there is a golden thread that uh, can be followed through the history from um, the beginning of the 20th century to contemporary sound art. This is the context and it provides the historical humus on which sound art, as we know it today, could develop. Around 1920, the French composer Eric Satie had proposed a highly functional music with his Musique de Amemblement, furniture music. So this music should fit into a room as naturally as a piece of furniture. It should soften the noise of knives and forks without droning it, without imposing itself. It should furnish the often annoying silence between guests. At the same time, it neutralizes somewhat the street noises that come into play. Uh, in doing so, Satie distributed the various instrumentalists around the performance space so that the music seemed to come from all sides at once. Uh, listening to it sounds a bit like this. Taken from a performance I found on YouTube, someone just playing it for, I think, 28 or 48 hours, I believe, during the lockdown. So a piece that can really go on and on forever. So this Musique de Le Mans can be seen as important precursor of sound installation. This is because Satie's idea now it shows astonishing parallels to approaches of sound installation art, which emerged about 50 years later. In both cases, it is primarily about the atmospheric design of a specific space with the help of sounds. The effects of the sound unfold even if the listener does not consciously or attentively follow them, so that it is largely up to the recipient whether or to what extent he or she pays attention to the sound. At the first performances in 1920, Satie is said to have shouted in vain, don't listen, go around, entertain yourself. So while Satie still wanted his sonic wallpapers and furniture music to under, be understood as purely functional and not as, at all as art, 
Today's sound installations have their permanent place in contemporary exhibitions and museums of modern art. For example, in the ZKM, the Zentrum für Kunst und Medientechnologie in Karlsruhe, which hosts sound installations on a regular basis. In such exhibitions, one often hears enthusiastic audience reactions. So like, I've never experienced anything like this before. This is completely new and so different. But yeah, sound installations look back on a history of more than 50 years and um, their, their origin can be easily be traced back to the beginning of the 20th century. Various upheavals in the arts and music were the prerequisite for the emergence of this new art form in the intersecting borderlands of music and visual arts. So I will try to briefly illustrate some of these developments. Um, so three radical changes in the understanding of art motivated by the avant-garde movements of the 20th century are crucial as historical basis of sound installation. First of all, the breakup of traditional boundaries between artistic genres between the mid 19th century is essential for development of the sound installations. Secondly, the change in the artistic concept of material is significant. This can be observed in the field of visual arts, but also as development within the music of the 20th century. The new possibilities of electronic sound generation and processing and the resulting changes in compositional processes play an important role here. Third, the transformation of the traditional performance situation, the artist's withdrawal from it, and the resulting new role of the audience form a crucial basis for the emergence of sound installation art as really art form. Um, until the beginning of the 20th century, the various arts were still essentially thought of as and practiced independently from one another. So even Wagner's opulent realizations of his Gesamtkunstwerk were really more than were just a position of uh, different means. So, but in the 20th century, things uh, really start to change. With the beginning of the 20th century, there were radical upheavals in the various arts. One influence was certainly the emerging industrialization and the many social and technological innovations of the time. Perhaps it was uh, the tension building up before World War I. Probably it was the mixture of the time and the place. An artistic avant-garde was forming in the European metropolises. A group of visual artists, writers, musicians, theater makers, and who wanted to clean up, the break, uh, clean up and break with old traditions. The group became known as the Blaue Reiter. Among the members were Vasily Kandinsky, Frank Marc, Paul Klee, etc. In the same title, they published their Almanach, a journal which they ex in which they exchanged their radical ideas concerning abstract painting, atonal music, Dadaism, non-Western traditional arts, multimedia theater ideas of visionary proportions. For example, here, this uh, thing by Alexander Skrabin, the Mysterium, he proposed to build this spherical um, concert space in the ocean in India and have uh, dance going on and scans and music and uh, lights and really a huge, incredible uh, multimedia um, show that he um, yeah, or wrote about in this Blower Reiter magazine. So he never really had the chance to realize it because he died um, two years after. But yeah, wonderful ideas in this Blower Reiter movement. So also, so in 1913, George Brock and Pablo Picasso established the form of, of the artistic collage. So they combined a wide variety of materials to create new works, newspaper clippings, fabrics, common objects of daily use, such as paintbrushes were integrated in the pictorial composition. Through such combination of painted and glued materials not previously used in the arts, the idea of the artwork as a homogeneous whole created in a single medium was put to disposition. Also, the everyday objects and materials were liberated from their original function, aesthetically re-evaluated and thus ultimately capable of art. They became independent carriers of meaning. Within a few years, French artist Marcel Duchamp took this understanding of art to its extreme with his famous ready-mates. He elevated ordinary everyday objects to, into the status of artworks, signed and exhibited them. 
Whereas uh, previously, the artist's material had been understood as a means of expression, Duchamp made use of finished industrial product. And um, so there are this idea of the object privé, so the found object came up, which is uh, still really relevant in all sorts of um, field recordings, for example, in music. So bringing in samples. So same time, Luigi Rossolo, uh, so inspired by the idea of the Gesamtkunstwerk, excited by the technological developments of their time and joyfully anticipating the future, a group of artists gathered in Italy in 1910 around the Italian writer Filippo Tommaso Marinetti, who called themselves the Futurists. In addition to various visual artists and poets, composers such as Edward Varese and Albert Doyen also considered themselves to be part of this movement. On February 2, 1909, the front page of the Paris newspaper Le Figaro featured Marinetti's Futurist Manifesto. This contained 11 programmatic theses that were intended to establish not only a new artistic movement, but also a new culture that encompassed all areas of life. In it, Marinetti called violence and war the only hygiene in the world and vehemently opposed all traditions, put fire to the shelves of libraries, divert the course of the canals to flood the museums, seize the pickaxes, the axes and the hammers and tear down, tear down without mercy the cities. So in this um, movement was uh, yeah, Italian, formerly painter and now inventor and uh, musician um, Luigi Russolo, he built, built these machines. So first, basically first machines to create noise. So the beauty of the city and he created this notation system to notate all his, I think, like 25 different machines he built. Of course, the first concerts were um, big scandals. Okay, now next uh, person. So also part of this um, Blaue Reiter Group, Vasily Kandinsky, so who was um, trying to develop a grammar of art as a whole. So he was concerned with the transfer of formal principles from one medium to another. For example, here, so in this this uh, picture, composition eight. So he wanted to, to translate structures from music to painting, rhythm, timbre, dynamics, movement, looking for equivalences in different media. Actually, he was picking up this uh, topic after listening to Schoenberg's 12 tone music. So then Kandinsky was also involved in the founding of the Institute of Artistic Culture in Petrograd, what is now St. Petersburg. This institute is considered the forerunner of the Bauhaus. Bauhaus was founded by Walter Gropius in Weimar after the end of the war. Paul Klee, Leonel Feininger, Vasily Kandinsky, Laszlo Mohr, um, Maholi Nudge, Oskar Schlemmer and others, representatives of this classical modernism, taught there and developed an interdisciplinary artistic program that included design, architecture, painting, dance, music, theater. Teaching at Bauhaus, Laszlo Moholy Nudge proposed a new form of theater in 1925 with his, his text Theater Circus Varieté, which would utilize elements of shock and surprise. He had the idea of placing electric and mechanical sound generators in the auditorium. Hidden under the floor or under the seats, they would play music, noises, or even speech. Between 1924 and 25, Moholy Nudge designed a piece entitled Mechanical Eccentricity, a synthesis form, movement, sound, colored light. In addition, he made a score sketch, which shows the events on um, three stages, including different projection screens. So this sketch already anticipates the score arrangements of the happenings that would emerge almost 30 years later. And this work may also be considered a mixture of performance and sound installation. Right, so then in, within, so Nazi Germany brought pretty much all these developments uh, to an end in uh, Central Europe, at least. So many of the Bauhaus teachers and students immigrated, uh, many of them to the US. Moholy Natsch, Josef Albers, Walter Gropius. Moholy Natsch went to Chicago and founded the new Bauhaus, which was later the School of Design in 1937. Josef Albers went to the newly founded Black Mountain College in North Carolina. So this school was a leading institute for interdisciplinary and mostly artistic education. 
uh, was shut down in 1957. So here people like uh, Buckminster Fuller were teaching. Also Albert Einstein was giving summer classes. And also American composer Jen Cage uh, received a teaching assignment in, to, to Black Mountain College in 1948. And uh, Cage, who might be seen as one of the 20th century most influential composers, is author of various key works in new music and author of various theoretical writings on composition. So in addition to this, he is considered as integration figure of the happening and Fluxus movement. And he was also an important initiator of the practitioner of sound installation art. Um, at Black Mountain, he uh, brought together a wide variety of arts. For example, in his uh, 1952 untitled event, he held uh, that he held in the school's dining room. While David Tudor played the piano, Merce Cunningham danced under Robert Rauschenberg's white paintings. So at the same time, slides of films were projected onto various screens. Poetry reading took place and Cage gave a lecture on Meister Eckhart. The happening lasted 45 minutes and was organized chronologically by a schedule created with the help of random operations. So here Cage dissolved the traditional frontal form of classic stage presentation by turning the audience into an integral part of the event and thus granting the recipient a new meaning in the context of art. So in addition to breaking down media boundaries, the alteration of the audience's perspective is its most characteristic, most characteristic feature being a great influence to the sound installation art. However, since these happenings and performances didn't give up uh, the traditional role of the artist as a performing actor on stage, it led into a different direction, namely uh, to the now widely differentiated field of performance art. Reading with Cunningham and Rauschenberg. Okay, in the following years, this, uh, the emergence of installation art was accompanied by the artist's withdrawal from the performance situation. So while in the happening in Fluxus concerts, artists were still performers who went on stage to make direct contact with the audience, this tra transition to installation art was accompanied by the artist's withdrawal from the performance situation. Um, American composer Max Neuhaus was the first to coin the term sound installation to describe his project Drive-In Music in 1967. He had installed several radio stations along a road with the same transmission frequency but different sounds, which were received differently by the passing cars depending on their speed and direction of travel so that an individual sound progression was created. Here this uh, installation it's another early one by Max Neuhaus in uh, Times Square in New York. So you're sitting in the middle of Times Square. Yeah. What do you hear? A lot of different languages. Yeah. El Metro, Volvo. Not a lot of noise. Uh, Is it like a mirage? Oh, that's an interesting question. What you're hearing right now is Max Neuhaus's Times Square, a sound installation that was first activated in 1977. Below this subway grate of which we stand, he went down and he installed speakers alongside homemade sound generators. And it's yeah. here, 24-7. You 24 can come seven, to Times Square. Seven days a week. Either yeah. people discover it or they don't. There's no <laughs> signs. I almost want to like grab people and say, hey, hey look. Do, do you hear this yeah, thing? Yeah. Right, so um, it's still there. So I've been there for almost 50 years now. Right, in the 70s, the new uh, genre of sound art gained popularity in the artist circles worldwide, resulting in numerous new sound installations and sound sculptures, such as the uh, spatial installations or uh, the Tonliege by Austrian architect Bernhard Leitner. So this is uh, now a new um, model, sort of this sound sculpture, a new type within sound art. So really some more sculptural object character kind of installation. 
or something like this in music musical cybernetic environment by uh, Peter Vogel, which was uh, exhibited in 1975 in the Donau Eschinger Musiktage. Um, actually, an interactive installation. So these um, these vertical objects had sensors, so you can uh, here is the really the setup sensors, and people could interact and trigger sounds and uh, make all this big ARP machinery back there create some some you know, whatever strange sound, interesting things. Um, Right, here's another example of a sound installation that actually is one that um, impressed me quite a bit because this is the only one that was in Hamburg for a long time, uh, permanently installed in the in the Hamburger Kunsthalle, in the building um, presenting the contemporary art, was recently took, uh, taken down, um, but it's, uh, well, let's see, it's also... So what happens here, there are these tubes of, uh, made of aluminum and they have a speaker inside and a microphone and uh, they record sounds constantly and play it through this uh, tube. And so also there are all these resonances created by the tube. Plus there are little mechanical hammers which once in a while hit these tubes. And it's um, sitting there and doing things um, does does sounds if no one's there but uh, if people interact with it it sort of takes what it finds within the room it's really, really, really nice work um, but actually it's so this uh, shows a problem with sound art that is uh, it's hard to contain it within a room in a museum for example so the sounds flow through the whole galleries and dominate the place Totally. So that's why the, the Kunsthalle finally took it down. Because after 15 years, like people got really um, um, developed some feelings towards it. Okay, here now, okay, this is a little bit uh, off topic, maybe not here in this. Uh, so this is um, the uh, American computer scientist, uh, Marin Kruger. He uh, is one of the really early uh, people doing multimedia installations and video art. So it's, uh, he started in the 1960s with his uh, work Glowfollow, for example, in 1969, which is uh, considered one of the first interactive multimedia installations. By means of pressure sensitive sensor mats on the floor, the position of visitors could be determined and evaluated by a computer. Movements in the room thus caused a change in the lighting conditions as well as the sound. Um, for him, interaction was primarily interest. So he writes, the only aesthetic concern should be the quality of interaction, which may be judged by general criteria, the ability to interest, involve and move people to alter perception and to define a new category of beauty. So that's, uh, he wrote that in 91. So I love YouTube for having all these really old vintage footage. When we footage talk about there. telepresencing, we say, if I'm at A, I want to be at B. My feeling was that there was another possibility. Uh, that other possibility is artificial reality. Its creator, mind. Myron Kruger, doesn't apologize for not having an arts background. He's a computer whiz. Artificial reality is created by using a video camera, a projector, and a computer. A person's outline is projected on any movement forces the computer to react, using a little green digital character called the critter. And the critter has all sorts of different behaviors, and I play with them as if you were a graphic pet. And it's designed to tell you about the, the sort of artificial world that we're entering. He's the first step, a playful creature who will come out and engage you in a new kind of play. Your body now is okay, reality as well. Further. It's artistic side. Right, body so this surfacing. is a beginning of the 80s, 82, I think. That so um, changes. Doesn't so look too to different to some of those uh, things that we might discover today. Okay, out of these not always linear developments within the visual arts and music in which the avant-garde movements of the 1920s and 50s play a special role, a new art form emerges that lives in between these traditional genres, uh, sound art. 
begin the precon preconditions, three preconditions, break off, uh, up of traditional separation of different artistic genres, change of concept of the artistic material in arts, visual arts and music, and the changed role of artists and audience. Today, sound art claims a permanent place in art history, and it has already produced its own differentiated history. Berlin-based musicologist Helga de la Motthaba has devoted herself with particular dedication to working out the connections between music and the visual arts, and to elaborating their significance in connection with sound installation art in particular. Unfortunately, her extensive list of publications is mainly available in German. The boundaries of the individual genres within sound art appear fluid, thus it is rather rare to find works that could be described as pure sound installations, uh, according to the characteristic of an idealized type of sound installations mentioned in the introduction. This fact is mainly due to the cross-border character of this art form. In most cases, visual and architectural aspects play a role in the works. Each artist sets the very own emphasis. In my opinion, there is not no really need to clearly distinguish uh, between sound art and multimedia installation art and media art and all these different things. So it's basically just a question of material used. So um, it's an academic question. For the sound artists, technology is both instrument and tool. The way of working with it wants to be learned and developed at the same time. However, each technology, each tool brings in its own workflow and functionality, which shapes and forms the workpiece in its own way. Um, Every Tool is a Hammer is a name of a recent book by American tinkerer Adam Savage that explores the evolution of sound and their influence and one's way of working with it. It's really a yeah, nice book, good read. Um, so the 20th century is characterized by the increasing mechanization of musical creation or the musicalization of technology. Again and again, one comes across personalities uh, who simultaneously assume the role of researcher and inventor, as well as that of composer and musician. Left Terman, Maurice Martineau, Friedrich Trautwein, for example, had a technical education that enabled them to construct new musical instruments. So in this case, the theremin, the Ons Martineau, the Trautonium, which they immediately used for their own compositions. Later in the course of the progress of the uh, computer technology, one meets personalities like Max Matthews, a name giver to Max, Jean-Claude Risset or John Schauning, the inventor of the FM synthesis, who were on the one hand programmers, on the other hand, used the programs and procedures developed by them for the realization of their own music. In short, the role of the composer changed with the entry of technical media into compositional practice. In the 20th century, the composer's workplace is no longer primarily the piano and the desk complete with music, paper and pencil, but the compositional work is created in the laboratory in the highly technical recording studio or on the computer. Like the electronically generated music, the sound installations draw from the almost infinite pool of new sounds that enriched Western music in the course of the 20th century. From Russolo's Intona Rumori and the integration of everyday objects such as sirens and chainsaws into music, and John Cage's prepared pianos to the sonic diversity resulting from field recording and sampling, as well as the electronic synthesis and entirely artificial sounds and noises. In the uh, historical context, uh, the development of electronic music reveals reciprocal relationships between art and technology that can be described as co-evolution. The question of whether technical progress caused the innovations in art or whether the cultural changes initiated by arts first formed the preconditions for the development of new technologies is comparable to the famous question of which came first, the hen or the egg. For example, the sudden availability of video equipment was hardly responsible for the emergence of video and media art in the 1960s. Rather, the avant-garde search for new means of artistic expression that would unfold their effect through the interplay of different senses. Thus, uh, artists repurpose the new possibilities of video technology for their happenings, fluxus concerts, environments, 
The new technology was merely an additional component of their intermedial works, but it ultimately provided the impetus for the emergence of new art genres, such as media or video art. So in the 1950s and 60s, it was common practice to alienate existing technology, radio or measurement technology, for example, or even to develop new devices oneself. In contrast, today's artists can draw from the almost unlimited pool of industrial tools for music production. So, uh, sound synthesizers have been developed since the 1950s, initially manufactured in costly small series uh, by companies such as Moog or Buchler, Arp, Sequential Circus, you name it, only available to a few. Today, such devices are comparatively cheap thanks to Asian mass production. Digital synthesizers and samplers have supplemented the range of available electronic and sound generators since the 1980s. During the 1990s, standard computers have become able to completely take over the functionality of a nicely equipped recording studio. And so today's computers play a key role not only in contemporary music production, but also in sound installation art. Flexible tools such as the graphical programming environment Max or Pure Data allow us to create our own software that, for example, controls random processes or analyzes input signals and on this basis generates sounds, interactive visuals or automation of studio hardware. Could also communicate through the internet or utilize uh, artificial intelligence algorithms. So everything goes. In addition, easy to program microcontrollers such as the Arduino family can be used to interact with the physical world by recording and controlling processes out of the computer. A variety of sensors can be used to enable real-time interaction, control lights, motors, or other electronic devices. So there are unprecedented possibilities for implementing your own ideas. As in the early years, we still find rather contrary approach uh, quite often, so outside the path of industrial and commercial music tools. Many sound artists built their own uh, sound generators and technical systems. Here is an example of a Raspberry Pi miniature computer running pure data patch, a channel system with integrated amplifiers, fully functional on battery and solar panel, Wi-Fi remote controls and all, all that. Um, so this artistic process in which the possibilities of existing technologies are tested and adapted to one's own needs, often through the, uncon con the unconventional use far of the handbook in many cases, give rise to ideas that inspire new works. Thus, according to musicologist Barbara Batelnis in 2004, this new type of composer of artist can be identified as tinkerer or maker, bustler in Germany, uh, whereby the negative connotation of this term, the hobby-like and unprofessional, is not meant. It's about exploration and experimentation as prime strategy, the free use of technology regardless of its original purpose, done with the aim of developing one's very own new and individual artistic technique. The internet provides the necessary communication platform under the acronym DIY do it yourself. A community of like minded people has emerged and they share their individual insights and procedures freely and free of charge. Hallelujah, internet, right? Uh, on the one hand, the tinkerer's way to approach problems shows parallels to the Dadaist idea of the found object, the object trouvé. On the other hand, it ties in with the futurist's goal of bringing together every day's technology and art. So as stated here in this 1922 futurist manifest, the mechanical art, thus a, uh, no, we futurists uh, force the machine to tear itself away from its merely practical function to rise to the spiritual and disinterested life of art to become a very high and fruitful source of inspiration. Okay, um, in the 16th century, various works uh, for multiple choirs were composed in the tradition of church music for the Basilica di San Marco in Venice. Here, the multi aisle architecture of the church was played by two opposing organs. Different groups of instruments or choirs were then placed on different galleries 
So that the first spatial music was staged here almost 500 years ago. So spatial aspects in music space. But the real integration of physical space as part of musical composition as a composable parameter of music did not begin until the 1920s with Edgar Varese's instrumental spatial compositions, such as Integrales in 1926, which was conceived as a projection into space, or was comp compositions by Arnold Schoenberg in his unfinished oratorio Jakob's Leiter, the Jacob's Letter, began in 1915. Schönberg envisioned remote music, so orchestra and choirs, to be conducted through a system of pipes to various different locations in the performance space. With the new technological possibilities of electronic sound production and control in the 1950s, these ideas were further investigated. The, earl the early approaches to spatialization, as we call it today, led into a designing forming, the design forming element of serial music with several compositions focusing on such spatial aspects. Stockhausen spoke in an essay of the rediscovery of the function of space. So to be able to position electronic sounds in space, you need a playback system with at least two speakers. Such stereophonic setups can create the impression that the sound source is located centrally between the speakers when the sound intensity of both loudspeakers is identical. Due to volume differences of the two speakers, the so-called phantom sound source shifts in the direction of the speaker with the higher amplitude. In this way, it is also possible to simulate movements of the sounds. However, the sound is always located only on a line between the two speakers. As early as 1950, French uh, composers Pierre Schaeffer and Pierre Henri used reproduction systems with more than two speakers for their musique concrète. For their symphony Pour un Homme Sol in uh, 1951, for example, they used four loudspeakers placed on the front and right, as well uh, as, uh, no, as behind and above the audience. Around the same time in America, compositions were being created that were reproduced by eight loudspeakers placed in a circle around the audience. These included, for example, Williams Mix, 1952 by John Cage in Intersections, 53 by Morton Feldman, both protagonists of the American so-called tape music scene. For these compositions, the loudspeakers were controlled by individual tape recorders that were not synchronized with each other. In contrast, Karl Heinz Stockhausen created works only a few years later, Gesang der Jüngling in 56 and Kontakte in 60, which were designed to be played back by a newly developed four channel quadraphonic tape system. Here, the four loudspeakers were set up in a square around the audience and could be controlled, uh, synchronized in time so that complex sound movements could be realized. At the 1970 World Exhibition Expo in Osaka, Japan, Germany's representative uh, pavilion was built a spherical auditorium with a 360 degree speaker setup, with speakers in 50 independent groups. Stockhausen was invited to perform his music here, electronic and instrumental, so there were 19 musicians on site, as well as other composers were invited, like uh, Bernd Alois Zimmermann. During the 180 days of the exhibition, exib yeah, more than 1 million people experienced his, uh, this fut futuristic sound show. Um, yeah, after the legendary Philips Pavillon by Le Corbusier, I uh, believe Georg talked about that in Brussels, this was the second visionary concert space built after the ideas of the musical avant-garde to be presented on the uh, expo. Today, sound artists use very different methods uh, of acoustic projection for their spatialization. So some works use state-of-the-art technologies, such as wavefield synthesis systems or multi-speaker domes for their spatialization, utilizing higher order amisonics algorithms, for, light, for example. In others, quite unconventional loudspeaker setups are used, often consisting of numerous speakers in a rather graphical arrangement. Really good example for this is uh, the works of uh, the Canadian um, <coughs> sound artist Robin Minar, who is teaching in Weimar. Um, so in many of his works, he has these uh, speakers um, which sort of look like they grow up the walls with the cables and so really graphical setup. 
also the the physical performance space is usually considered as really important component of the artistic work many sound installations are developed spite, site specifically so they they are designed for the respective performance space and often they establish a contextual reference to it However, if we uh, compare different installations, we see a large variety of systems. So there are installations that just play back pre-recorded sound loops. In contrast to that, there are also generative, in generative installations that are based on certain mechanisms that implement rule sets for generating the musical content in real time, like the one Georg and I did for the Kunsthalle. Also, there are interactive installations that allow the audience to playful interact with the setup. There are performative installations where the artist is part of the presentation, maybe only for a special event like the vernissage. Um, sometimes concerts are played within a sound installation. So the sound artist's motivations, topics and realizations are really manifold. But after having conducted several interviews with sound artists, it uh, became quite obvious to me that working with the exhibition space and its atmosphere was very important to all artists I talked to um, during, um, during research for my, my um, dissertation. In this context, a sound artist Robin Minard talks about conditioning or coloring of space. Um, by this, he means his idea of the aesthetic transformation of a found atmosphere. He creates almost static soundscapes projected into the room with the intention to intensify or change the space's basic mood. Also, by adding his additional sound layers, he can mask disturbing noises. These aspects, and especially the idea of masking noise, are central ideas to HFMT's project Healing Soundscapes. In a cooperation with a Hamburg University's hospital, the UKE, sound installations were developed to improve the acoustical environment in different hospital settings. The here used term soundscape was coined in the late 1970s by Canadian artist Murray Schaffer in his famous book, The Tuning of the World. He described soundscapes as layers of acoustic noise omnipresent in the world, constantly growing, especially in the cities. But uh, luckily, in the course of everyday, mostly purposeful listening, they are usually ignored. So the human sense of hearing is evolutionary, designed in such a way that we always try to assign a sound. We try to assign a sound to its origin and due to our distinct ability to localize sound, also deduce where it comes from. So this has proven to uh, support survival. Uh, imagine the tiger coming up from behind. The abstract, often electronically generated sounds and noises of the sound installation mostly lack any association to a natural origin. Categorical assignment of a musical sound to a certain instrument usually does not work here. And through the transmission by means of loudspeakers, the sounds are decoupled from their source. We do not longer hear something in the way that we hear, for example, a car driving by or a telephone ringing, but we hear in the sense of listening. So the philosopher Martin Heidegger in 1960 called this form of hearing abstract hearing. We never hear, for example, tones and noises, but we hear the storm whistling in the chimney. We hear the three engined airplane. In order to hear a pure sound, we must listen away from things withdraw our ear from them, hear abstractly. The uh, German philosopher Gernot Böhme describes such a form of listening, which is no longer purposeful, as characteristic and necessary for the perception of acoustic atmospheres. In doing so, he speaks of hearing as such. Böhme has devoted himself to describing atmosphere as a category of aesthetics, for more than two decades, thereby he criticizes aesthetics as a theory of the artwork, which has degenerated into a means of forming judgments of art criticism, into a theory of taste. Aesthetics had thus detached itself from its original conception as a theory of perception and central cognition, as it has been developed in the mid-18th century by Alexander Gottlieb Baumgarten. So the term 
um, aesthetic, as, as aesthetics is derived from the Greek term aesthesis, which means sensual perception. Um, so in several publications, Brume introduces the atmosphere as a central concept of the philosophical movement he represents, the new phenomenology. Yeah, but again, most of Böhme's uh, publications are in German only, so sorry. Böhme promotes a concept of the atmosphere according to which this is to be understood as the relationship of the summed environmental qualities to the human condition. Thus, the properties and qualities of the space and the objects within it, including light and sound and scans, always affected their surroundings, radiating their qualities and thus contributing to the atmosphere of the surrounding space. So for Brume, sound is only one component of a perceived atmosphere. The perception of an atmosphere results from all different sensor, sensory modalities, and its particular perception and evaluation is shaped by the individual's emotional state. He therefore also calls atmosphere a typical intermediate phenomenon, since it describes the relationship between subject and object. On the one side stands the environment which radiates its specific objective mood quality. On the other side stands the recipient with her or his subjective perception and the individual mental precondition. On the one hand, this in-between makes the atmosphere special. On the other hand, it makes it theoretically difficult to grasp. It appears to be blurred, which results from the interaction of the recipient's subjectivity and the objective environment. So Böhme calls these atmospheres as uh, almost objective or quasi-objective. So according to his theory, interior architects, stage designers and musicians who produce, for example, the background music known as Musak, for department stores, train stations, or hospitals can be described as aesthetic workers. These people specialize in retuning spaces by modifying the existing atmosphere. If an interior designer, for example, equips a room with a sea green wallpaper, then he is not after all concerned with producing walls with that color, but with creating a spatial atmosphere. If a sales practitioner in a supermarket lets a certain music sound, she does not, after all, bring a work to the ear, no, bring a work to the ear, but wants to create a sales favorable mood. So it seems quite possible to artificially or artistically produce very specific atmospheres. In consequence, there is a commonality of sound artists with interior architects, stage designers and sales strategists. They all, as aesthetic workers, manipulate the found atmosphere of rooms by intensifying the atmosphere with the help of added sounds and noises, subtle changes or completely overhaul. However, Böhme's work does not yet allow any conclusions to be drawn about the specific impact of certain sounds on the resulting atmosphere and the accompanying subjectivity feels, uh, feelings and state of mind. So it always must remain subjective and unique. Nevertheless, this acoustically produced atmosphere of the sound installations can be influenced and artist artistically shaped to a great extent. It is clear from various empirical studies that there is no uniform meaning of music for humans. It is fundamentally questionable whether the same music has um, the same emotional effect on different listeners. So if one wants to get to the bottom of the effect of music, as Peter Hesse said in 2003, the question should not be how music affects people, but rather which music has which effect on which people under which conditions. So it is a question of whether the multilayered effect on the recipient is homogeneously perceived by different persons. This would be shown, for example, if a verbal description of a perceived atmosphere turns out to be similar for different subjects. This could be considered as evidence for that the atmosphere indeed can be regarded as quasi-objective, as it is proclaimed by Böhme. If so, atmosphere 
would be highly relevant for the research of the perception of sound arts and actually music as well. It helps a lot that we are used to exchange ideas about atmospheres. Everyday language offers an astonishingly rich vocabulary for this. This then also raises another question. Does the experience of the recipients coincide with the assessment and intentions of the sound artist? Does the recipient perceive it in a similar way as the artist, as aesthetic worker? Is the atmospheric intention communicated? Or should we better assume an unpredictable individual and completely subjective experience here? The letter would suggest that the personal experience in the sound installations is always unique and completely subjective. Um, actually, I didn't know about this for a long time. I was really wondering, since in literature you read both. You read, read it's, uh, uh, it's super subjective, and you read um, atmospheres are quasi-objective, so described in a really similar way by different people. So I um, turned, uh, when doing my dissertation, to these questions. So this was basically what I wanted to try to find out. Um, contemporary music and uh, sound installations and all this is very often advertised as experiment or experimental. Um, let's talk about perception, um, investigation, or new experiment, uh, experience, all, all this, this kind of wording, uh, in the program notes on, on new music and multimedia art. Um, I also did that for a long time, uh, when writing these notes for my, my pieces. Um, but, uh, when thinking about this a little bit more uh, during, uh, when, when doing my dissertation, also in the context of uh, this, this idea of artistic research coming up in uh, German academia. I uh, figured that this uh, coming from the academic experiment, where people have a certain setup and try to gain insights on a certain topic. And are really so the most most uh, interesting thing in, in a scientific experiment is the result of it. So this is something in all this experimental music, um, I see that people seem not to be really interested in their results. They put up experimental setups, um, but don't really, so they get applause in the end, but don't really ask if their, their experience was successful or not. So this was something that I wanted to, um, to look into, actually. And I, uh, for my... Um, my uh, dissertation designed a setup. So basically, uh, going back, so I, I did that at, at the university, so I couldn't really do it under the constraints of artistic research, but I uh, had to do it under the regulation of really hard science in the university and musicology. So people were not really interested in my artistic output at all. But it was about the um, methods of doing experimental research in um, uh, on site, so a field experimental field study and basically a mu music uh, psychology. So, um, but still, I um, since there is, uh, as I said, so the the the, the Stefan von Hühne installation, the Hamburger Kunstel was put down. Um, so um, I used this um, this yeah this situation to create my own um, installation as as research environment basically. Um, let's bring it on. So it looked like this, uh, in the Hamburger Gängeviertel was 2011, already a while ago. Um, basically an eight channel installation, uh, integrated in a bigger, bigger exhibition with uh, different works by different people lasting for two weeks. Uh, some sensors built here, so some this is some ultrasonic uh, distance sensor and uh, yeah, so basically um 
a yeah pretty uh, pretty abstract sound um soundscape uh still a little bit interactive um right and um what i did here i had this questionnaire and um asked 100 people uh, to rate the atmosphere that they found on this site so i gave them a list with um uh hold on i'll bring up my uh max uh, um so basically a list of uh 62 adjectives that were to be rated from zero to seven so really uh so i didn't really take the time to translate them but uh let's take uh, whatever experimental so absolutely not experimental at all or yeah, totally experimental or really peaceful no not peaceful at all really peaceful so left is no and right is most experimental and so on uh, what i did then so based on this idea of uh, uh, gern und böhme um i figured okay so the the so-called artistic worker should be the one who uh, should be really good in um judging all these um descriptors on on the atmosphere but actually all my participants should also be able to do it so what i did is uh so i myself had uh, or had uh, what do you say it so I, I i did four of these takes on the questionnaire one before doing this installation before putting it up so this was basically as artist in this case my expectation so this was what i intended to do and then during the um installation i did this a couple of times as well so i did it during the vernissage and i do it did it in the middle somewhere and also in the end so if you just look at look at it without doing any statistics here seriously you can see there is a rather stable judgment on these different um, properties of the atmosphere um if you then take the or should i bring them back or oh, whatever i'll bring them back um if you then look into the 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 um the recipients uh the the participants of my study you can see they look it looks first really pretty pretty random what they do right so you see here lots of variation on on certain um adjectives so some are pretty um, small bandwidth of variation but some seem to be really uh, randomly distributed so hell light bright brightness maybe or intensive um okay but we bring this up now to all 100 and if we then take the 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 um the the median or the um mean value of my hundred people you see this corresponds pretty beautifully actually to um my atmosphere so this was uh, for me the starting point so i in, in my dissertation i won't present that today but i so this was my starting point really surprising to me i was really um um yeah surprised to, to see this because i didn't expect it i was more thinking that this would be a really subjective um experience and uh, but this shows that uh, atmosphere is something that is really um intersubjectively similar and um quasi objective i would agree with um Ume on this um right so this is uh right the setting of the installation my patch on it um so in conclusion so still after more than half a century practice in this sound installation art it uh, can still be really interesting um from artistic uh, perspective in my opinion especially the really open format and the freedom for unique artistic expression offer many, many options. So there is less pressure for the artists involved compared to tr traditional music 
because there is not really the need to be on the spot on this one minute that you have to or the these eight minutes that you really have to perform but instead sound installations can be developed in a as, as progress so you they can be constantly optimized and adapted to to certain situations and uh so they also offer a very attractive setting for research in my opinion in uh, the installation setting um for example it's it's absolutely no problem to conduct a study using a long questionnaire as i did in in my my dissertation so that took really more than almost almost an hour to to fill out this questionnaire but um so most people even said that this questionnaire helped them to e even better listen and understand this this work but this is something you probably could never do in a, in a traditional concert so listening to whatever a beethoven symphony while filling out your 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 questionnaire doesn't just doesn't work um so i i i believe so this is really a chance of experimental um true experimental work in, in music perception maybe thank you for your attention